Welcome to Get It Growing, the gardening program of the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners. My name is Janae Foley, and today we are delighted to have with us from the Ellis Shoe Ag Center, Dan Gill, who is the author of Louisiana Gardener's Guide. Today, Dan is going to be discussing bulbs, and let me say that we include in the term bulbs, rhizomes, tubers, all the technical words. We right now don't want you to be concerned about those technical words. What we want you to do is listen up and learn how to grow these, this wonderful variety of flowers, how to take care of them, and how to enjoy them. So Dan, what's the first thing to consider when you're ready to plant some bulbs? I would guess that you whip out the glossiest catalog you can <laughs> find and place an order. Well, you know, we divide bulbs into two really large categories. Spring flowering bulbs, which right. we're planting in the garden this time of the year, and summer flowering bulbs. And the spring flowering bulbs generally bloom around from January, like the paper whites will bloom very early, all the way through about late April. And then the summer flowering bulbs come in in May and continue on through the summer. So First off, I decide whether I want flowers in the spring or, or during the summer. Right. And then it's also important to appreciate that bulbs are a very, very diverse group. So there's a bulbous plant that you can grow just about anywhere, from shady conditions to full sun, from poorly drained conditions, crinums love to grow with their feet wet, right. to very well-drained conditions. Most of the spring flowering bulbs like a very well-drained condition. So you can look at where you'd like to use a, a bulb pipe plant decide what kind of flowers you want from it, what time of the year you want to bloom, what the growing conditions are, and really then make your selections based on that. Spring flowering bulbs are commonly sold this time of the year from those slick magazines, right. and boy, it's like a candy oh, shop. <laughs> oh, it's tempting, it is tempting. We do want to mention that sometimes slick is good. Sometimes the color photograph catalogs are the best source of your bulbs. Sometimes they're not. Just like Dan was saying, you know, you've got to educate your little yourself as to what bulb you want to plant, and then you've got to educate yourself as to where you're going to get that bulb. One of the sources we recommend is, we've mentioned it before on the program, is a site on the internet called Garden Watchdog. It very helpfully ranks all the catalogs for you. It lets you know the number of complaints. People, gardeners, are free to write in and critique these companies. They give stars to, to the companies that give good customer service and quality product. It's a site that if you're going to spend an appreciable amount of money on bulbs, you want to check out. And of course, we can, we can also get good quality bulbs locally. And it's always nice to buy locally because you can actually, you know, look at the bulb itself, examine right. it, look right. at its quality and size, uh, but you can't always find the best selection locally. Right. And so if you're looking for something uh, off the beaten path or a cultivar that simply isn't available locally, it's always nice to be able to mail order. It's getting late right now, but if somebody wanted to order some spring flowering bulbs, we can plant those bulbs as late as the early part of December and still have some good success. So if somebody really got on their internet <laughs> real quick and ordered some spring flowering flowering bulbs, they can still get them in the ground. Right, okay, but let's say, let's say you have your bulbs. You've picked up this handy dandy little packet of tulip bulbs at the garden center. Now, what's the next step? Well, depending on the kind of bulb it is, most spring flowering bulbs that you purchase can be planted right into beds immediately mm -hmm. without any special treatment whatsoever. But two of the spring flowering bulbs that we grow here, hyacinths and tulips, don't get enough chilling in our mild winter uh, uh, area down here, and so we have to artificially lengthen the winter for them. So when you buy your tulip bulbs, you need to bring them home, clear out a spot in the vegetable bin of your refrigerator, and put them in there for about six to eight weeks. Now it's very important, you'll notice that this bag has holes in it. Mm -hmm. The bag that the bulbs are stored in has got to breathe. So a net bag, a paper bag, or a plastic bag with holes in it all work well, but you shouldn't use just a plain plastic bag. In addition, once you get your bulbs in the bin, avoid putting any fruit, such as apples or pears, in the bin with it. They give off a gaseous hormone called ethylene. And these bulbs will absorb that ethylene and it'll make them bloom abnormally. Label them thoroughly, make sure nobody thinks they're onions or anything, and right. uses them in a casserole. And we pull the tulips and the hyacinths out 
Between Christmas and New Year's or the first couple of weeks of January and plant them in the ground then once they've had their chilling and once the ground has gotten nice and cold. And they'll typically bloom for us around about March or early April depending on the cultivar. Now, if you're not, for, uh, one, one thought that crossed my mind, it's very important, Dan was saying, to put these in the refrigerator. And he means the refrigerator, not the freezer. I know people that have destroyed, you know, significant quantities of bulbs thinking that if cool was good, colder was better, and it, that's not necessarily so. And the planting depth for most of these bulbs should be given in your on your instructions. It is, and, and it's always good to, to look for that, but one thing to keep in mind is that we plant bulbs a little more shallow here in the Deep South, and so you'll see tulip bulbs being recommended to be planted as much as eight inches deep. Mm -hmm. Here this package says six inches, which is not too bad for us, but on average the larger bulbs like tulips and daffodils and hyacinths, we plant about five inches deep, no deeper than six inches, and then smaller spring flowering bulbs, we might plant those about two inches deep. Now, and sometimes we do get caught with our warm weather and you're not successful with tulips. Unfortunately. That, that's just a chance you take in southern Louisiana. If the weather stays warm, they're not going to do well for you. It's nothing you did. They just bolt. They don't, they don't come up and make that long, pretty stem that, that you associate with tulips. It's nothing you've done wrong. It's just a year that nobody's tulips are going to do well. And in that case, you know, one, one option you have is to purchase the little pre-budded tulips from your garden center. We would suggest if that's the route you're going to go, and that, that's an easy route, and if you love tulips, that's a fun route, too. You enjoy them, you're watering them for a couple of weeks, you select a, a, a tulip bud that's firm, not one that's about to open. Get a you know a firm one that's not that's showing maybe a little color, but not not three quarters ready to wait, ready of the way to open. When you're finished with it, you chunk it under your azalea and its fertilizer. And that's one another point. It Tulips is indeed for us. And in fact, a lot of the spring flowering bulbs are really a one-time shop for us. They, they almost always bloom nicely in the spring, but tulips and hyacinths, tulips rarely come back very well. Hyacinths will send up little small spindly mm -hmm. spikes of flowers. Many of the daffodils and narcissus do rebloom well for us, and you have some snowflakes right over there. Mm -hmm. They rebloom well for us as well. So if you find a good local reference and look at the bulbs listed in that local reference written for Louisiana, they're going to indicate the bulbs that are most likely to rebloom well for us. Us. And that, by the way, when they're, when they're re-blooming and that they're a little more carefree, they're hardy, the term that's used is naturalizing. If you see that term used, that's what it means. Generally, they're referring to daffodils. That means that they're going to be hardy, they're going to come up, they're going to go down. If you associate it with, you know, old homesteads, those are the frequently the varieties that, that they're discussing that when they use the term naturalize. But don't forget, when you're looking at catalogs mm -hmm. and they're talking about naturalizing bulbs and naturalizing, they may talk about naturalizing with tulips right. or they may talk about naturalizing with bulbs that do not rebloom well down here. So make sure if you're going to use bulbs in a naturalistic way that they are bulbs that will reliably come back for us. One other thing I have to say about spring bulbs, I wouldn't have a spring garden without them. But the money you spend for bulbs, these right. tulips will bloom for about a week to 10 days. Right. And for 650, you get about a week or 10 days worth of blooms. If you spent 650 on a flat of pansies, on the other hand, you would get months of flowers from the pansies. So I usually tell most gardeners, use the spring flowering bulbs as an embellishment or accent, an accent. and put most of your gardening budget for, for fall, winter, uh, and spring color into the bedding plants, but don't overlook those great spring bulbs. Why? Right, because they're, ju they're just so neat. I mean, everybody likes to see at least three tulips blooming every oh, yeah. spring. Now, we started to talk about the little snowflake, and, and I diverted you back to the daffodils, but this is one of the, the little smaller bulbs, but it is, it is just such a honey of a bulb. They're not as expensive as your, as your tulip bulbs. If you can find them, you know, they're usually in the, in the pack. We're going to actually pull one out just so you can sort of see the size. Mm -hmm. And this is a favorite of both Dan and I's.
beautiful little spikes of dangling white bells with little green dots on each petal. Uh, I was just saying earlier, I think of it like a lily of the valley flower, but it's large and robust, so it's on steroids, kind of. But very reliable for reblooming, and these bulbs will actually take less than ideal drainage. The snowflakes will, especially during their growing season during the wintertime. So it's a really nice bulb for coming back year after year. And I like the foliage. The, the, the color, it's usually a deep green, and the contrast of that deep green with those little white bells is just stunning. It's one Absolutely. of my favorites too. Now let's look at the um, the spider lilies too. Those those have just about finished mm -hmm. finished blooming, but they're a good fall plant. We too. think of these as a uh, a summer, or you can maybe even say fall flowering uh, bulb. But it blooms in September and October, and that's still pretty much summertime <laughs> down here. These have finished. And they're just beginning to send their foliage up, and that gives this plant one of its common names, naked ladies, mm -hmm. uh, because they send up this naked flower stalk without any foliage whatsoever. When the flowers fade, then they start getting their foliage up. So winter is their growing season. A lot of people ask us about what to do with these old, ugly seed pods. Mm -hmm. What do you usually tell people? I generally ignore them. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> I really do. I have better things to do than go out and be, and be that super sensitive about what's going on in the garden. They're usually flopped over by the time I notice. <laughs> to well, be honest. I, t I do say gardeners, if you want to neaten things up, right. this doesn't help the plant any. This isn't a benefit to the plant. It's not going to make the plant any happier if you leave them. In addition, Notice what this plant is doing. These little uh, uh, lacoris are making seeds, and they put a lot of effort and energy uh -huh, into uh -huh. making these seeds. Well, we don't need the seeds. We don't want the seeds. So by cutting these flower stalks off, when they begin to fade, you can prevent the plant from putting a lot of effort into seeds you don't need, and the plant can use that, that energy to build bulbs. Don't forget, uh, leave this foliage alone through the wintertime. Wow. Don't mow it back or cut it or anything. It needs that to bloom well for the next year. Now, let's we were getting off of the subject before we move on to other bulbs. These are little paper white. Mm -hmm. Now, paper whites uh, belong to a group that we call narcissus, mm -hmm. um, and they produce a brilliant white flower. Some people don't like the fragrance of paper whites. Have you encountered that before? Yes. Oh, yes. they just hate the mm -hmm. smell. I think it smells nice, but if you ever try to grow paper whites and you hate the smell, then don't grow them again. But they're a really great bulb. You can plant them into your garden this time of the year. They're one of the earliest blooming bulbs. They'll bloom as early as mid to late December or January, mm -hmm. and they'll come back and bloom in your garden year after year. But a fun project is to force some paper whites. You can plot them up in pots, and if you put bulbs in pots, you always want to make sure the bulbs are planted with the little tips sticking out. We don't plant bulbs as deep in containers. Paper whites, though, can be forced in just a, a bowl full of pebbles or rocks like you have here. Once you place the bulbs in, you put enough to fill the container nicely without crowding too much, and you add enough water to come up to the base of the bulbs. Now, the problem that most people have with paper whites is they find that they get very tall and, and very floppy. floppy. Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons why that happens. Paper whites need to be grown very cool, very chilly, mm -hmm. and they also need abundant light. If you try to force paper whites on a windowsill indoors, the indoor temperatures are very warm for our comfort, and that makes them stretch, and most windows don't really provide a great deal of light. So my advice for people who are forcing paper whites is to force them outside on a patio sure. table where they get plenty of sun and lots of cold weather. You only have to bring them in if it's going to get down below 30 degrees. Then when they make a nice stocky plant and produce the buds, you can bring the plant inside for display. So if you keep them cool, give them plenty of sun, you're going to have stocky, wonderful paper whites like you see in the nurseries, not those tall, floppy giants right. that so often that, end up that, on our windowsills. Right, that end up up. Now, most of these bulbs, too, that's one point we haven't discussed yet, is the sun requirements of, well, of the bulbs. This is interesting. These bulbs are adapted to a deciduous forest, and they're dormant in the summertime. So during the summertime, when the trees have lots of foliage, they're asleep, and mm -hmm. they don't mind the fact that it's shaded. When they're in growth, these bulbs need lots of sun. Right. Well, under deciduous trees that drop their leaves in the wintertime, there's abundant sun during their growing season. So you can actually plant these into beds under deciduous trees. As long as they'll drop their leaves and they get plenty of sun in the wintertime, they work very well there. Uh, but most bulbs that we use for spring flowering bulbs need a fair amount of sun, at least about six hours of direct sun during the day to really bloom their best. If it's a tulip and it's not going to rebloom for us anyway, you may get away with putting it in a bit more shade. Right. It'll weaken the bulb, but it'll still bloom, and you're going to throw it away after it blooms anyway. Right, right. Here's another little delightful 
smaller bulb for us. The, the Zephyranthes, um, Zephyr is Greek for wind, and mm -hmm. Anthes means flower. And so the Latin name of this plant literally means wind flower. And they have wonderful, graceful foliage and flowers that do kind of move in the wind as it blows. Mm -hmm. But the name rain lily, which is our most commonly used common name, comes about because these bulbs bloom intermittently through the summer, very oftentimes after we have a drier period followed by a good heavy rain. This uh, white uh, variety is a really nice one and stands out well with these round kind of grassy leaves. And this with the broader leaves, beautiful pink flowers right. that are really, really nice in the landscape. The foliage is evergreen, and many of the bulbs that we use, like the spring bulbs, have a dormancy period where they disappear. But I love these uh, uh, rain lilies because the foliage persists year-round and keeps the area looking nice. And there are more and more hybrids. This is a little hybrid variety. There are more and more hybrids being being introduced that have a little bit, you know, stronger petal substance and a little brighter color. I think, you know, in, in the next coming years, there's going to be a fun variety of these available. We're offering the yellow at our, our plant sales, and I know we're in the nursery beds developing a, a white that has a little thicker petal substance. Nice. So in the next in the next few years, this will be a, a fun group to keep an eye on. One of my favorite of the summer flowering bulbs. Now, let's talk about the amaryllis. We're getting now into some of the the bulbs that you frequently plant now are you plant, can plant later in the spring. If, you're, if you've received an amaryllis as one of the Christmas gifts, which all of us like to have like a red poinsettia, a little red amaryllis blooming. And they are wonderful, you know, I think for children because you literally can see these plants Great growing. Project. A kid can take a ruler and measure it and the next day you're going to have measurable growth on those stalks. It's just amazing that that flower comes out of these bulbs. Spectacular, it's spectacular. flowers as well. Yeah. Interesting thing about amaryllis is they are a spring flowering mm -hmm. bulb for us. They bloom around about April uh, and they are I think the most magnificent spring flowering bulb and our climate is mild enough to where we can actually grow these in our garden. Up north they're strictly container plants. Right, right. Here they're very great plants in the landscape. However, this is the time of the year the bulbs become available. But because those bulbs were dried off and forced into dormancy, notice that this one that you have growing in a pot still has a lot of foliage on right. it. Those that you buy in a nursery, because they've been forced into dormancy, are triggered to bloom around about December. That's right. why this will pop there for Christmas. Right. But if you plant the bulbs into your garden now, and they bloom in, at Christmas when that cold weather is coming through, the flowers may not hold up when we get a freeze. So typically, although we may put them in our garden eventually, when we first buy amaryllis bulbs in the nursery this time of the year, we'll go ahead and pot them up in a container, grow them on a windowsill, let them bloom indoors over the winter this year, and then around about April, take that bulb out of the pot and plant it into your landscape in a spot that gets sun for about half a day. There it will be naturalize, become a permanent part of your landscape, and it will bloom every April thereafter. So even though the bulbs are available right now, and we're planting most spring bulbs right into the ground, for the amaryllis, because they're going to bloom so early, it'd probably be better to pop them on up. But if you have them in the garden, there's some things you can do this time of year as well. Right. Now, I want to show, too, we discussed this before we started, how really crowded these not only can be, but they they like being this crowded. Actually, in this, there's one, two, three, four. Now, generally, you think, well, you know, when something gets this size, you're thinking, ah, I better be moving it up. That's not the case with an amaryllis. It's, it's the case, actually, with, with several of the bugs. The agapanthus, too, the, the, the spider lily that we just talked about. They like to be crowded. They don't want a lot of room for their roots. And remember too that this is an exception, that this, this plant will take a little bit of shade. So they're good under, under a lot of trees too. You have to find that little spot where it gets enough sun, but, but not too, too much sun. Now the flower bud is already there right. in this large bulb right here that will come out and bloom next April. 
these smaller bulbs surrounding, this one might be big enough to produce a spike, but these other ones probably aren't. But if you had a friend that really loved your amaryllises mm -hmm. and they were a special friend and you wanted to share right. them, because they've already set their flower buds, you could actually divide your amaryllises this time of the year, or you could wait and divide them around about March of next year if you prefer. Now we're going to actually do that. This is a amaryllis that won of our staff brought in this morning that she dug up. They've become crowded to the point, and this happens, that it's actually affecting your mother bulb. Too much. It's, it's deteriorating your mother bulb, so at this stage you really need to get some of those little bulbs away. Let's see. And what you're going to do just is, is very, very gently separate, and you're ready to share with friends. This is an especially um, neat variety, the little papillon that, that looks like you've probably seen pictures of it in the catalog that, that's more open. It looks sort of like a little butterfly. It's got the more of a whitish mm -hmm. and, and, and red cast. And you want to leave these roots on. The, you know, you don't want to get carried away and start cleaning this, cleaning this up too, too much. And you, like you're saying, mm, think this one will bloom, I think, probably next year. You have to be Papillon patient. Papillon is a small cultivar, so the bulbs are naturally right. smaller, but I agree. You'd have to tell your friend that you were dividing right. it with. Right. If not this year, maybe next year. And some, some of these bulbs pout a little bit when you divide them, too. They're, you know, they want to take some time. They want to get resettled. They're not going to stress themselves, and it's really better that they don't stress themselves. And so you may be you may be waiting two or three years for a bloom after you divide these or the or the agapanthus. And we do want to mention too about the seeds from an amaryllis. If you want the same variety of amaryllis, you want a bulb. You don't want to mess around with seeds because you're going to wait three years and you're not sure what you're going to get. So. You know, you've got to beg your friend for a little offset of her amaryllis if she has a special one that you really want. Now, these are always fun bulbs to mess around with <laughs> because they're just so big. You don't lose these, the, the wonderful crinums, Dan. Very tough plan. I, I, I might say I've been into the New Orleans area several times since the Ooh. terrible flooding that they had. and. Very few plants were able to tolerate and survive the flooding. The live oaks fortunately did very well, and a lot of other plants did. But you may see a brown yard, all the grass is dead, all the shrubs are dead, and there's a clump of crinums just as green and happy as anything. Bill Welsh, an extension agent out of Texas, says no crinum has ever died. So if you want a tough bulb, crinums are a really great choice. Uh, they're really a bulb not readily available in nurseries. They're right. still one of those pass-along plants, so you kind of find a friend that has some, some bulbs and, and you get them uh, to share with you. Again, you can, you can divide a crinum this time of the year or in the spring, uh, but one of the largest bulbing plants that, that we grow, but many different kinds of flowers, a very diverse group of plants, there are many kinds of crinums, both different kinds of species as well as hybrids between those species. But an old-fashioned southern plant that is really seeing a resurgence in popularity. Twenty years ago, if you said crinum, most people have no idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And this really deserves to be brought back and popularized the way it's becoming. Let's talk about planting depth of these two, because it's different. The amaryllids, and, and this is related to the amaryllis, mm -hmm as well. Unlike the spring flowering bulbs like tulips and, and uh, hyacinths and daffodils that we were talking about earlier, where we plant them fairly deep, these uh, amaryllis uh, related bulbs prefer to have a shallow planting. And so we normally plant them with a part of their neck exposed. With the amaryllis, we may plant them like you, you had in that pot there with the shoulders actually mm -hmm. showing. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the crinums, we plant them burying most of the neck but still leaving part of the neck sticking up out of the soil. So uh, crinums are buried a little bit deeper uh, than we would amaryllis, but still do well. One other thing about bulbs is they have these strong roots, and many plants that make true bulbs have the ability to regulate where they are in the soil, either right. pulling themselves a little bit deeper or pushing themselves up a little bit higher. So unless you grossly mismanage the depth of planting, many bulbs will seek their preferred depth and, uh, and grow well from there, so they're not that fussy. Right. Now, the one exception is, I know the St. Joseph's lilies, you have to keep an eye on them because they will actually pull themselves so far down into the soil that they'll stop blooming. 
So the St. Joseph's lily, which is the, the common amaryllis that's around in this area, the white bloom with the little white streak in it, keep an eye on those because, as I said, they will actually keep pulling themselves down in the soil, and, and you need to lift and divide those every few years to, to keep your bloom coming. Now, let's quickly talk about the cannas, maybe, because they're such a wonderful new variety of those available. This, too, you know, we all have the mindset of the old yellow and the orange uh, and, and crinum uh, cannas, and they are just coming out with such wonderful foliage. This is a, a green and white striped one. This, look at the, look at the mm. coloration on that, just the, the bronze green foliage. And we quickly, I lifted one because I wanted to Dan, Dan to demonstrate. This is a problem you run into with the cannas, is you have this really old nasty growth on it, and it's, it's important to get the, the part of the plant that you want when you're dividing it. Well, although we use the term bulb generic, right. Um, it is important sometimes to realize that, that what we call bulbs are different structures, like you mentioned at the beginning. Cannas actually grow from a rhizome, right. and we will divide rhizomes and cut them up into pieces at the drop of a hat, where you'd never generally want to take a crinum bulb and just cut it in half. So with this, with this rhizome right here, I'm going to put this right down here, we see we have a growing point right here, and we see we have a growing point right here. If we look around to the back of it, we can see that this looks rather old, tired, and isn't really producing any new growth. So one thing that we could do with this is we could go ahead and cut off this, we call it the, the back bulb.